In letters of crimson, God wrote his love on a, on a hillside so long, long ago. Where for you and for me, Jesus died, and love's greatest story was told. I love you. I love you. That's what Calvary said. I love you. I love you. I love you. Down through the ages, God wrote his love with the same hands that suffered and bled, giving all that he had to give. A message so easily read. I love you. I love you. That's what Calvary said. I love you. I love you. I love you. Nothing but the blood, the blood of Jesus. I love you. I love you. That's what Calvary said. I love you, written in red. Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to Grace Family Bible Fellowship Church here in beautiful downtown Cortland. Uh, we're glad that you've joined uh, with us today online, and we trust that as we worship the Lord together and uh, hear a message from His precious Word that uh, you will be blessed. And thank you also, Lois, uh, for singing that song, I Love You, written in red, which gives us a, a gospel message uh, all the way from Genesis chapter 315, when God tells us of the Redeemer that He's going to be sending, and it goes all the way through to when Christ died for us on the cross of Calvary, uh, a very true and uh, powerful gospel message. Um, just this morning we have a, uh, a few announcements that we're going to uh, give to you. Uh, Blair, Nicker Blair Nickerson will be bringing God's Word to us today. Next Sunday, Reynold Jansen will be with us, and uh, looking forward to that, both of those uh, messages. And also the Kids Club uh, still continues, will be for two more weeks 
on uh, Friday evenings at uh, 6.30 p.m. So you can, uh, if your kids are, are liking that and they can avail themselves to that 6.30 Friday evenings. Um, also coming up, we're hoping uh, that uh, as of the July, maybe even July 1st, that we will be able to hold services back here in the building again with a congregation of people. And uh, so then we're looking forward to that. Also, we may be able to have an outdoor service uh, where you can come and uh, sit in the shade and uh, we'll have some special music and a uh, wagon set up so that uh, we can have a good outdoor service on Sunday, something like today where it's just uh, beautiful outside. And uh, um, also we're, we're, we're looking forward to the fall uh, in August when uh, the, the uh, Vacation Bible School may take place. And we're trusting that that will be the case and also maybe even some outdoor camping and things like that for the young people. So these are the announcements that I have, and if you have your Bibles, I'd like to read in your hearing a few verses from the uh, book of Mark, chapter 16, uh, beginning at verse uh, 14, uh, where Jesus has, uh, has appeared to the disciples, and it reads uh, like this. It says, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And those signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, and they will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. May the Lord bless uh, this portion of reading from his own precious word. And now let's take a few moments and uh, bow our heads in prayer together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have made. And we thank you that uh, we are able to listen uh, online to our own local church service. And we thank you that this is a uh, something new and something that we hadn't done before. And we just uh, praise your name that uh, people can and can hear your word even from their own homes, uh, sitting in a comfortable chair and possibly even drinking a cup of coffee uh, while they listen to the word of God being taught and as they uh, um, have fellowship even uh, one with another uh, from a distance. Father, we just uh, thank you for your precious word and we thank you for all of the things that it teaches us. We thank you for the truths that it contains, and we thank you that your word of God as a whole, the Bible, is truth. And it is not uh, just relative truth, but it is, it is uh, true truth. And Father, we just thank you that we can trust it, that we can believe in it, and that uh, we can use it as a uh, means of uh, information and instruction for our own whole lives. Father, we just um, thank you that uh, things are getting better as far as uh, this COVID uh, situation is concerned. And as we look forward to when things are opening up and we can get some of our quote-unquote freedoms back, uh, we just look forward to that and we look forward especially to having fellowship one with another with the uh, Christian friends and relatives that we so much uh, love and have missed over these uh, past uh, several months that have, we have had. And Father, we just uh, pray now that as we uh, go from here and look into your word, that you would be pleased to give us understanding and, uh, and discernment as to the truth that you are teaching us today. And we just pray that you would just uh, bless us and that through this week, which is ahead of us, because we have been taught by you today, that we will be able to bless someone else with, the, uh, with uh, just who we are uh, as Christians and that we will be a reflection of your son, Jesus Christ, and those whom we meet, those whom we know, and those who are strangers to us. And we will give you the praise, honor, and glory through Jesus' name, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. We always like to worship on the Lord's Day. Some days, some weeks, we can't because of what's been going on, this shenanigans, uh, for over a year now. But we come together to praise the Lord, to worship Him, to acknowledge Him for who He is. Uh, Gary has already prayed. I appreciate all that he does in the service of the Lord. And we thank you, Lois, for your music and your talent that God has blessed you with. And before I get uh, into the message, I do want to say, I pray the Lord put a, a guard on my mouth to keep me from saying anything uh, contrary to the word. 
uh, contrary to um, the Lord's leading. We have been educated after we became Christians and in many ways uh, for many Christians uh, it was not a thorough job and it was uh, many things that we should have heard that we didn't. And I want to get into some of that today. And I had Gary read because this is what Jesus was indicating the church and the people in the church should be from the beginning. Uh, they were told to go into the world and preach the good news to all creation. And normally we hear the Matthew version where we're to go into all the world and to uh, teach and make disciples. And unfortunately, disciple making has not been a strength uh, for many years in many congregations. Well, for us to be good disciples, we need to follow in the steps of Jesus. We need to do what he did. Peter, in Acts chapter 10, 38, sums it up this way. Uh, that uh, you know what has happened throughout Judea beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him and these verses in Mark he tells us that that is um, part of, but it goes beyond that. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. The emphasis is not on the baptism, it's on belief. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Doesn't say the apostles, doesn't say the leaders in the church. It is everyone who believes. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison it will not harm them at all. They will place their hands on the sick people and they will get well. Now that's a promise from God. How many of his promises does he not keep. Oh, he keeps them all. He keeps them all. So, in order to receive this power, these disciples were then told to go to Jerusalem and wait there until they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, it fell. They did speak in tongues, and they were given power and miracles did follow. Well, um, it is told to us in other scriptures the spiritual gifts that are involved in this. There's Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Corinthians 12 as well. And some people claim that the gifts, especially the ones in 1 Corinthians, ended with the death of the last of the apostles. And it is often based on an interpretation of part of chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians, known as the love chapter. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now we see but poorly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I hope in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And this is the, the proof that the verses that they base it on is uh, a little just before this. For we, 
We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, imperfection disappears. And many translate or interpret that as meaning when the scripture comes. Well, we have the scripture. We have the canon of the Old Testament. We have the canon of the New Testament. But it actually says, um, where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. This will pass away. Knowledge will pass away. That's when those gifts will pass away. So it is not now. Some people also look at, I believe it's in Second Timothy, where Timothy, um, near the end, he is expecting to be released from prison, and there is an incident where um, I didn't write this uh, reference down totally, but it is where Paul is giving instructions to Timothy, and he says that he is he had to leave. Um, oh, escapes me now. Had to leave um, one of the disciples. Not Tychicus. Uh, he's there. I left Trophimus sick at Miletus. Well, if Paul was still healing, why was Trophimus sick? And I don't have an answer for that. But the answer is definitely not that gifts have ended. Gifts have not ended. And we have um, other indications as well. Here's another example of the basis on which we are to go out and to heal. It is not just for the apostles. In Luke chapter 9, it says that Jesus sent out the twelve, and he sent them out two by two. And they went, and they went, given, given the authority that Jesus gave them, he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he uh, told them to take nothing with them, everything would be provided on the way. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. And later there's a report when they come back. And they were surprised at what happened. But then later, going beyond the 12, Jesus sends out in Luke chapter 10, you can read the account, where he sends out the 70 or 72, depending on the, the version you're reading. The, uh, the difference is not a large difference. One of the things that is common in scripture is rounding. So it may have been, and likely was, 72, but in some it was rounded to just 70, a round number. Uh, and when they were going into a town, and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. And later on, we read this account when they came back. The 72 returned with joy and said in verse 17, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So this is not just the close group of 12 disciples around Jesus. This is the wider group. And we see in the church, it also goes beyond what those original apostles were because we have um, the deacon, Philip, who was used and uh, he was transported from place to place. He met with the eunuch on the road um, as the Ethiopian official was leaving and heading back to Ethiopia. And then he was transported to Caesarea. 
and later it says that he had four daughters and they were all prophets. So again, this goes outside of the main leadership of the, of the church. It goes to really include everyone within the body of believers that Jesus calls and empowers to do certain things. Well, we, as 1 Corinthians 12 says, the Spirit gives these gifts um, and he makes the determination who. The, the other one that was not part of the original 12, of course, is the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul uh, did many things, including raising from the dead. Who was it fell from the window in Troas? Three, three stories up? <laughs> he preached longer than I'm going to preach today. And um, he fell out of the, the window and they went down to fetch him. He was dead and Paul was used to raise him from the dead. None of this is done for our glorification. None of this is done for our benefit alone. It is to bring glory to God. And many times in the Gospels, when Jesus performed miracles of healing, uh, etc., and raising from the dead, it stated, these things were done to bring glory to God, including raising Lazarus from the dead after he'd been four days in the tomb. Lord, he stinks. Yes, he did. But Jesus called him out of the tomb. He came out and his life was restored to him. So much so that the leaders wanted to put him to death at the same time they were plotting to kill Jesus. Why? Because he's proof. He's proof that Jesus had power that they did not have. And today, unfortunately, in the church, there are many that do not have the power that Jesus has and that he gives to his disciples uh, through the Spirit, as the Spirit determines, and it is not to lift us up. It is to lift Jesus up. It is to glorify God the Father. Jesus says um, many times in the Gospel of John when he was about to leave and he had said it before that he and the Father were one. And what was Jesus doing in John chapter 8? It says he was doing what he saw the Father doing. So all of those things all of the healings, that was all done to imitate, to do what his father was doing. This is the good God that we have as our God and he desires us to go about doing the same things. The miracles that Jesus did, one of the things that happened from that, people were attracted to come because Jesus was the source of miracles. And while they were there, he would teach them. He would teach them about the Father. He would teach them about the proper interpretation of Scripture, not the interpretation that the Pharisees gave. And we have the same thing available to us today. God desires people to see us living out Christ in this world. And that means that under normal, what should be normal Christian life, people are attracted because they see things that are so different from the world. They see sickness being healed. They see, they see a, a blessing and a prosperity upon believers. But that blessing of prosperity is not for us to spend it on ourselves. The Apostle Paul uh, definitely tells us we are intended to have more than what we need. But 
It is to bless others. It is to meet the needs of those that don't have everything that they need. So this is a very different understanding. We hear uh, much against the prosperity gospel. Well, the prosperity gospel um, is incorrect because often uh, it is presented as a way for us to get more, to live in luxury. But to live in luxury in a world of starvation, in a world of um, still slavery in the world, it is estimated that in today's world there are 40 million slaves in the world. And that's more than there were in Jesus' day. So, no, the prosperity is not for us to have money in the bank to spend it on whatever we want. It is to be used at the direction of the Holy Spirit. And if we don't follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, then God is not in a position to continue those blessings because we have not passed the test. We have not shown that we are willing to obey the leading of the Spirit. And when we are not willing to obey the leading of the Spirit, the Spirit is not able to continue to bless us in that way. You can get into teachings about uh, the talents and the use of the talents. But too many Christians in this day are taught and uh, they become complacent. They are taught that it is enough to come to church on Sunday and to sit for an hour or so and then go home and live their life during the week any way they want. But that's not the Christian life. We are told we were bought with a price. And because we were bought with a price, we are, as Paul says, bond servants. We are bound to Christ. He is intended to be our priority. And that is not to lead a dull life. That is not to be wearied with the burdens of this world. That is to be a blessing to those around us, to be a blessing to those in the church, to be a blessing to those in the world, and to be an answer for life's questions for people that are asking. How many people in this current environment with the virus are in desperate straits that mentally they are being pushed Mentally, they don't know where to turn. They don't have the supports they need. And so many of them are quietly, desperately calling out for an answer. The answer is us and Jesus who lives within us because Jesus has the answers. He has all the answers. And if you don't know him, then you are definitely missing out. And as a Christian, if you are not in a position to answer people around you with the desperate questions that they have, then you should be uncomfortable with where you are in your relationship with the Lord. When we look in Scripture, and we, we look, we think of the Old Testament and those like Moses, Joshua, um, Jacob, Abraham, Noah, uh, no matter where you want to go, David, Samuel, there is something that is common to all of them. Elijah, Elisha, and this is, they had a living relationship with God. They did not rely on previous generations. They had to have their own experience. I listened to a message just the other day 
they were talking about Jacob. And um, I haven't had time to go follow through all the scriptures. It talks about uh, Jacob as an example of this, where early in his life and right up to when he went to Haran, God was referred to as the God of Abraham and Isaac, not Jacob. That changed the night that he wrestled with God. He was probably about 97 years old at the time. And he wrestled all night with God. And he had an experience where later uh, he referred to as God being his God, the God of Israel. Well, Israel was the new name that he was given that night that he wrestled with God. And Israel was not a nation at that point. So he was talking about himself. God was no longer just the God of Abraham and Isaac. God was now the God of Israel. He had been given a new name, but he had a direct relationship with God. And this is what we need. And how do we do that? We do that by spending time. It is not sufficient to take five or 10 or 15 minutes, read a little bit of scripture, say a few words in prayer, and then off to the rest of our day. What it actually talks about, um, the Apostle Paul, again, talks about pray without ceasing. Well, how do you do that? Um, you can't walk around with your eyes closed. You're going to bump into things. You can't drive anywhere um, in that state either. So what is it? It is having a mindset that is focused on God. And you are conversing on and off with God through the day. But when you spend time with God alone, you're quiet. You're quiet enough that God can speak. You don't fill every second of your conversation with God. That's talking at God. If you want God to speak, you have to be willing to hear. And you have to be willing to get the noise of this world out. So you have some quiet time alone. And when you have quiet time alone, and you spend that time with God, it will not go slowly. Maybe at first it will, till you gain uh, some experience with it. But as you go along, there will be joy in spending time alone with God. And God will speak. The Holy Spirit will give you ideas. The Holy Spirit will suggest certain things that you go here or you say something um, in certain situations. And if you have that attitude of listening to God and having a deeper relationship with God, you will be able to experience the joy of a conversation with someone where you speak of what you know. You speak of your experience with God, with Jesus. And that will have the, the ring of authority. And uh, as scripture is used in that, God says his word will not return unto him void. When we use God's word, it has power. And again, I have heard uh, oftentimes of people sitting under the, the hearing of God's word without direct prayer for healing, but just under the hearing of the word. And that power of the Holy Spirit using that word in a person's heart, and they're healed. 
No one had to touch them. No one had to uh, invoke anything directly over them at all. Just God moved and healed. His word is powerful. And in the Christian life, you should have some excitement. You should have uh, real joy at knowing and experience Jesus living in you, moving through you, and meeting needs of people around you. If not, be careful. The seven letters to the churches in Revelation, the last one, the letter to the church at Laodicea, is very frightening. It talks about those who are lukewarm. They are either not, they're not hot and they're not cold. They're just lukewarm. To me, it sounds very much like many people who come to church on Sunday, sit in a pew, and then go home. And where is their life with Jesus? What are they learning? What are they putting into practice? It doesn't sound like very much. We are challenged by God. And if you look at uh, Romans chapter 12, and not looking into the section later in the chapter about different gifting, but at the beginning of the chapter, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, uh, flowing from the cross, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. A sacrifice no longer has a life of its own, but we are to be living sacrifices. We have life, but it is not ours. Living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. How do you do that? The word has to get into you. It has to have meaning in your life. And we have a perfect example in Psalm, one. Psalm 1, we are told these words. I'll just read the first half of the psalm in closing. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night, and he is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. That is somebody who has an active relationship with God. They read the scripture, they allow the Holy Spirit to speak to them, as they meditate on it. What does this verse mean? What does this idea mean? Where uh, does it apply in my life? What should my life do? How should it be changed based on the scripture that I'm reading and thinking about? And the result of that is that God is in a position to bless. And it says, whatever he does prospers. So. God desires to prosper us. He desires to bless us. But if we look at what we're told in Scripture, blessings are conditional. Blessings are conditional. Oh yes, we have the ultimate blessing of eternal life with Jesus. But if you want to enjoy the Christian life, it takes obedience to what we find in Scripture allowing the Holy Spirit to put this into our life, put it into practice, bring change, transformation, and God is able to bless. May God bless you richly as you continue your day. 
and this week. Um, the Lord uh, bless you as you uh, continue to think about these things and consider what Jesus desires you to do on hearing this message. God bless. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sigh or a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to, to be happy in Jesus. Trust and obey. Wow, we were so close. <laughs>